everyone. This is Mackenzie Bean, Managing Editor with Becker's Hospital Review, and I'm so delighted to serve as your moderator for today's session, Lessons Learned from the COVID-19 Vaccine Rollout. On behalf of Becker's, thank you all so much for joining us today. Today's session will give healthcare leaders an opportunity to pause and reflect on the vaccine rollout, which is now well underway nationwide. I'm joined by three great panelists who will discuss key lessons and best practices for the rollout, what they wish they'd done differently, and future considerations to keep in mind as new vaccines enter the market and deployment expands. Before we get started, I just want to share a few quick housekeeping items for our audience members. We'll begin today's webinar with a panel discussion, and we'll have time at the end for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the session by typing them into the Q&A box that you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link that you've used to log into the webinar to access that recording. If at any time you don't see your slides moving or you have trouble with the audio, please try refreshing your browser as that might help. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box as we are also here to help. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce today, today's panelists. Caleb Sanford is the Chief Operating Officer at Tiburcio Vasquez Health Center, which has nine clinic locations located in the San Francisco Bay Area. Rajiv Pramanik is the CMIO at Contra Costa Health Services, a federally qualified health center also in the Bay Area. And Meg Aronow is the Senior Vice President of Client Success and Platform Evangelist at Well. Before joining Well, she served as CEO for Adaris Health and as a Senior Research Director of the Advisory Board's Information Technology Strategy Council. Meg also previously served as Vice President and CIO of Boston Medical Center for more than a decade. So Caleb, Rajiv, Meg, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So I thought a good place to start our conversation about the vaccine rollout is by looking at some of the inequities in terms of vaccine access. Maybe Caleb and Rajiv, I can start with you on this question. What are the inequities in getting the vaccine to FQHC communities that have been brought on by social economic challenges and the lack of digital access? What are you seeing there? Caleb, would you like to start us off? Sure. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, you know, there were iniquities in our system before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And so, you know, with this push to vaccinate, test, and now vaccinate, uh, I think it's exposing a lot of those iniquities. When you look at the vaccine rollout, you know, to get 150 million people a vaccine really quickly, the most efficient way to do that is to create an electronic online platform where the bulk of the work can be done without humans, right? None of our organizations are set up to, to have the human power to sign people up for appointments, that many people for, for a special appointment that they need now for a vaccine. And so the most efficient way is to do it online electronically. Uh, but by doing that, it certainly leaves people behind, you know, the people that aren't able to access the platform, the people that aren't able to receive the text messages or emails that we send out. Um, and so while, while the efficient model that a lot of us are using to vaccinate thousands and thousands and thousands of people every week um, is getting us closer to herd immunity, perhaps, it's certainly leaving behind a lot of people that are vulnerable and really need the vaccine. Um, leaving us to figure out how do we find those people? How do we reach out to them? Yeah, I think Caleb, you, you hit the main points is that you scale what you can scale rapidly using technology, focus your resources on the other areas where being having community centers in our different FQ sites, us also having a public health arm working with uh, other CBOs and making sure there's a trust that you're using that you've already established and maximizing that trust and encouraging people that were hesitant or that can't do it uh, via uh, electronic means. Um, yeah, so it sounds yeah, like I think that. too, you know, no. we need to, I, I just ahead, wanted to man. jump in. So I think too, we need to uh, go back to the beginning, right? The, the law of large numbers doesn't always play well with inequities, right? So even if we 
If we go back to when vaccines first started being distributed, they were distributed logically to the places that we thought had the, the largest reach, many academic medical centers and other sites uh, in our areas. But it took a full two months, really, until they started being distributed to our federally qualified health centers, the neighborhoods that had some of the biggest need. So, you know, it was new for all of us. Uh, but we, we started out in a way that probably did not serve um, the budding disparities that well. Yeah, I think that's a great point to add on, Meg. And, it, you know, it sounds like it really is such a fine line between harnessing that technology to make this huge process possible, but also, um, you know, being cognizant of what inequities that in itself is causing. Um, I think another big thing we keep hearing about also is the pace of vaccine distribution. Recently, the U.S. hit 4 million doses a day, um, a new record. That said, I think there are still a lot of obstacles and challenges with this pace. I'm curious to hear from you all, what are some of the factors that have slowed down the vaccine rollout? And in your, in your opinion, what are some better or alternative ways to determine who is eligible? Yeah, it's kind of a, a, a that that's probably one of these things where it's it's been changing over the time. Um, at first, there wasn't enough vaccine and the inadequate access to vaccine. Then there was this. Well, let's hold back how much we focus because we don't know how much week to week we're going to get vaccine. So we didn't want to invest in the operational and logistical infrastructure, be it uh, uh, ultra low freezers or, or nursing staff or administration or call centers till we know how much vaccine we're going to get. Uh, and now we've hit kind of a sweet spot. We have vaccine abundance in many places in our county, for example, and we're, we're just ramping up as much as possible working with partners. I think some of the eligibility issues and the constant changing and confusing uh, the jurisdictional changes, especially in the Bay Area or other multi-jurisdictional areas that we see in Boston, New York, LA, where it's not just one area. So if you live in the border, this county or jurisdiction is saying 16 and above, and this is saying 50, and then you have someone who works in a in a um, essential worker or not. There's a lot of confusion and communication from high up, from the federal level to the local level. So somehow um, going back to that age where we're at now with the current uh, administrations, wherever you are, is, is trying to simplify. Um, the other thing is uh, the and also not requiring proof, but just using using trust in the community and vast majority of people just saying what's true and coming in and getting that. At least those were my thoughts. Caleb, I know you, you had similar operational challenges if you want to. Yeah, I, th I think first it's important that everybody keep in mind, and, and it would be nice if, <laughs> if the public would keep this in mind, that us trying to vaccinate you know, the entire country is the hardest thing that most of us have had to do in our careers, how to scale this up really quickly and and vaccinate you know every person that lives in our country, but then to add on to that, uh, you've got the federal government declaring what they would like vaccine eligibility to look like. You've got the state governments declaring what they would like vaccine eligibility to look like, and then you've got the local jurisdictions, the counties, uh, declaring what they would like vaccine eligibility to look like. And so for you know us in our little part of the country here in California. Uh, those three messages have not been the same. They've been similar, but not the same. And so uh, the community gets confused about who's eligible and who's not eligible. And the eligibility has changed so much over the last two months. We started with healthcare workers, and then it, it got widened to kind of more healthcare workers. But does anybody really understand who's a healthcare worker at this point? What does that include? Then we went into the elderly population, which was great. That was the easiest. <laughs> when we did eligibility based on age, that was by far the easiest way to do it. Uh, and then we moved into uh, essential workers, but only certain essential workers. And so, you know, thousands and thousands of people who had been told they were essential workers throughout the pandemic, uh, who, who had to keep coming to work and keep running their businesses, a lot of them were not actually eligible as essential workers to receive a vaccine. So all of that just creates confusion around who can get vaccinated and who can't. 
And then there's the question for those of us administering the vaccines, how much do we enforce these rules? You know, do we let people slide because they were confused? But then does that open up the community to think that anybody can come to our site and we get flooded with lots of people that aren't eligible? Um, so it's been a constant kind of give and take tug of war of, of negotiating this ever-changing eligibility criteria, trying to get as many people in as possible, trying not to turn away people, but at the same time, turning away people that shouldn't be receiving a vaccine yet. Uh, and so it's been difficult. It's been difficult. And for those of us doing the work, it's been difficult. You can only imagine how hard it is for the community who really wants a vaccine, but is unclear of whether they can get it or not. Yeah, and I think that's where we made, a, a at least in the a Contra Costa uh, Public Health Department and in our jurisdiction, we made it where at the administration sites, we were not requiring proof for any vaccines we allocated to those providers or systems. Um, it, it, a, you're right, confuses people. You don't want to turn away people. B, the proof is maybe challenging for individuals to have. And, and uh and there may be confusion and one negative thing with with a site can just kind of explode and i think so the, I agree the, real... the age thing the age yeah. thing has been the the best and the easiest we just want to make sure you are who you are with that appointment nothing else yeah and i think the challenge that that we've had to think through here is the goal with these eligibility criteria is that we're vaccinating the most vulnerable people first, theoretically, right? The people who are uh, in businesses, face-to-face -face contact with people, we want to protect them first. And that makes sense to a large degree. But I think because of all of the confusion and because of the rules, I think it's slowed how many vaccines we can really give. Just as an example, today at one of my clinics, we had capacity to do 700 vaccines. We're probably only going to do about 550 because I ran out of eligible people, people that we could readily identify as eligible to, to outreach to. Um, and I think that's happening all over where, because we're so restricted in who we're supposed to give vaccines to, uh, we run out of people that are able to find us through the available mechanisms. There's lots of people who are eligible that are not getting vaccinated. But again, that goes into the earlier conversation of those are the people that require much more work to outreach to and to pull in. Uh, that a lot of organizations just aren't aren't equipped to do. Yeah, I think it's it's clear there's really, you know, a plethora of factors affecting the rollout and its efficiency. First, it was not enough supply. Now, in some places, an overabundance. Um, you know, like you said, Caleb, really such a patchwork of confusing eligibility rules um, for health systems or organizations to navigate. So. A lot going on. I know um, you mentioned the additional outreach needed for some people who may not be, um, you know, very tech savvy or may, might not even have internet connection. Um, so I want to talk about that next. You know, we live in such a digital world, but clearly not everyone has that access to technology. So how do we provide care to the people that can't do telehealth or they can't sign up for a vaccine online because either they don't know how or they don't have that internet access? Um, so how do you handle that, but also balance, you know, creating infrastructure to enable mass vaccinations? It seems like such a dichotomy. Well, I think there's a, it's not a, it's an and, right? You have to do both. So what mm -hmm. we have done in our, we have a managed care plan of more than 200,000 lives. And then we have to also, address the community of 1.1 million people. We wanna make sure that we are scaling our technology. So out of those 200,000 or 1.1 million, the 900,000 who can do it electronically, great. Let's scale that and maximize that. So then we, we save our resources for the other folks that need to call or that we need to help transport or we need to meet them where they are or go to the people that they trust. Right, be it at their church or whatever CBO, uh, send mobile units to their home and working with multiple groups because those are gonna be high, uh, high risk populations such as in skilled nursing facilities or homebound people that are dying or were dying from this and that need to be vaccinated. And the other folks that, that can online schedule, let's do that so they don't have to go to the call and, and save the caller and operator times for the for the woman that's on this thing, maybe she has to call and we don't want her hold an hour. 
Yeah, I think I think what's been really neat with the pandemic as kind of a positive of it is, you know, there's been this misconception, and I really think it is a misconception, that the safety net population doesn't know how to use technology. And that's really not a fair representation. Uh, you know, many, and, and we probably could argue most of our patients in the safety net have cell phones, have smartphones, have computer access. Um, that maybe we didn't realize. And so throughout this pandemic, first is we had to transition from all in-person visits to more telehealth, video visits, phone visits. Um, and now in the vaccine movement, you know, working on ways to, to make that online and, and uh, people have been able to figure it out. A lot of our safety net population has been able to figure out. And that's really exciting because that means we can do a lot more innovative things with the populations we serve that maybe we didn't believe we could do before because because I think internally we held this misconception about our population. So that I think has been a, a neat positive effect of the pandemic is, is us learning to trust our patients and us learning to give them more credit than, than perhaps we were before. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit a big, big item here, Caleb, where it forced the governments and the payers to think that our patients and our systems could give care beyond the traditional face-to-face -face visit. We had disrespected them, thinking that's the only way you have to come to our clinic, our place, and, and this in electronic infrastructure, be it well, uh, and utilizing that and making that and meeting our patients where they are is an essential kind of pivot that, that unfortunately with COVID, but fortunately we'll be able to hopefully do in the future ongoing. Um, where we can now present value in these web portals and communication where we did it before because we didn't trust that they would use it. Now, looking at it broadly, we also know as we look at many of the state efforts, right, it, it's, there's two sides to the communication, right? There, there are those of us trying to reach out, and there are the recipients. And we know, not at your organizations for sure, but in many places, the outreach uh, missed the mark, right? Particularly some of the states that were trying to very quickly spin up some technology. Um, so we're learning, um, as was said earlier, this is new to most of us, right? We have to develop a whole new public health infrastructure. And we gravitated immediately to technology and, and some places did that better than others. And, uh, you know, to Caleb's earlier point, um, there's more technology savvy folks in our universe than we perhaps give credit to. And that's, that's something I think we can exploit in a positive way going forward in addition to the communities that, that you all serve through the uh, health center environments, I think the membership group that uh, was in question were, were the elders who we knew we needed to get those vaccines to. But, you know, that's something, um, just being at well, I'm very aware around statistics around uh, things like smartphone utilization. Uh, and I think most people would be surprised that almost 70% of folks that are over 65 are using a smartphone. Uh, in some way, maybe to talk to their grandkids, you know, whatever it is, but they've got that phone in hand and that's just such such a great vehicle to reach folks in our communities where they are uh, in a timely way. So I think I think we'll learn going forward. I think this was a, a bit of a tragic experiment, uh, but we'll take some lessons away, I think, for for should we ever need to communicate this broadly again. Absolutely. I think, you know, like you said, Meg, it's such a process. And I love the phrasing you use to exploit in a positive way the fact that maybe more people are tech savvy than we realize. I think that's really interesting. Well, and um, it's not exploiting for our benefit. From, it's really it's really exploiting for the patient's benefit, you know? Like nobody yeah. nobody wants to go to the doctor, right? Nobody likes taking time off from work mm -hmm. to go see their primary care physician or to go to a specialty appointment. Uh that's just a bad experience for everybody, right? And so to be able to provide that experience virtually by phone, by video, uh, other electronic means, that's just giving the patients what they want, when they want it, where they want it. Uh, and it's unfortunate that it's taken us this long to figure out how to do that, but now we're all being pushed to do it. And, and the winners here are the community, the people out there that need healthcare. Absolutely, and that are craving that convenience. So I think you're right. Perfect. Well, let's switch gears a little bit from the technology angle to um, 
Another challenge with this rollout, which has been vaccine hesitancy, not only among the general public, but also among some healthcare professionals. You know, we've seen studies, research reports coming out um, in which some hospital staff are saying they're not um, interested in getting the vaccine. I think it really brings to light an internal conflict between sort of science and politics. Um, so Caleb, I'm curious from your perspective, are you still seeing that hesitancy? Has it evolved during the rollout? What are you seeing? I think it's definitely evolving. I think, you know, the first day when we vaccinated our staff, uh, you know, we maybe got 60, 65, 70% of them. I think more have been coming through since then. The, COVID vaccination is becoming more commonplace, right? Now everybody's getting it, everybody wants it. People are realizing when the CDC comes out with their declarations that we can start getting together, we can start traveling, we can start doing all these activities that have now become low risk because we're vaccinated. Uh, I think there's certainly more motivation for people to get vaccinated. They're seeing that, you know, nobody's getting, you know, overly sick from the vaccine, nobody's dying, nobody has you know, nano robots crawling through their bloodstream because they got a vaccine. So I think a lot of the myths that have been out there are getting debunked just by people watching each other. Um, but there's still people that that aren't getting it. One, one of the we use paramedics to do a lot of our vaccinations. And one of our paramedics that probably did 200 vaccines in a day um, was choosing not to uh, not to get vaccinated. And it's uh, it's sometimes hard to understand those decisions. But, you know, everybody has their their agency to make those choices and, and we have to respect that and but at the same time try to educate and make sure everybody realizes that there actually is enough vaccine for everybody we will be able to vaccinate you you don't need to not get a vaccine because you want to save it for somebody else um, and so i think we'll get there we'll get there and yeah, i think we sort of a lot of um oh go ahead I was just going to ask a follow-up, Meg. Maybe you can weigh in too. But you know, what sort of reasons um, are you hearing from healthcare professionals as to why um, they're opting to not take the vaccine right now? I'm going to leave that one to uh, to Caleb and Rajiv. They are much closer to that population. I'm on that. So as a as a um provider and in our system, we've seen a lot of uptake for vaccine. We do an annual flu vaccine and there are health orders and requirements in different employment areas that, that all caregivers and clinicians need to be vaccinated or use masks. Well, this year it's, you have to use a mask regardless. Then people are, well, I'm already using a mask. Why do I need a vaccine? I wanna wait. I think um, now that uh, we've administered more than 100 million in this country uh, doses and we're getting there, the, what Caleb was mentioning, people, that hesitancy is disappearing in a lot of, lot of people who are just worried. Uh, and then you add the, the, the political thing during the election that caused, well, I don't trust the previous administration or I don't trust the current administration. Uh, I think some of those things are dissipating and it's just pockets of areas that continue to work with their trust in the historical uh, systems that we have. And trusting uh, us to that this vaccine is efficacious and and safe, um, the same individuals we model that didn't want flu vaccines in the past on our annual flu vaccine drive are the same individuals we noticed in their same races and and locations that had hesitancy. So well beyond, I know this is specific to healthcare professionals, but this is just the same thing throughout our community, and, and we're still working on those, and that's. That's going to be a perpetual kind of uh, challenge. I think one of the biggest travesties of this whole thing is that uh, COVID-19 has become a political issue, that COVID-19 vaccinations has become a political issue. Uh, that's just really unfortunate that healthcare is ever a political issue, but, but particularly with this, where it's so easy to save people's lives, where every person that we vaccinate is not going to die. Right. It's that simple. If you get vaccinated, you will not die from this disease. And somehow that's become politicized. And and it's just unfortunate that we don't have everybody in Congress from the, you know, the administration, local governments. It's unfortunate that they all aren't going to their constituencies and saying, please get vaccinated. Look at me get vaccinated. I really want you to do it. Uh, 
it'd be so easy for that to happen. And, and it's just unfortunate that it hasn't. And so anything that we can do to, uh, to help change that culture of politicizing healthcare uh, is only going to benefit the community. Absolutely. And Meg, I wanted to give you an opportunity to add your thoughts as well, if you'd like. Well, I think what we, you know, what we're seeing at our customer uh, base, which is where we, of course, run into the most healthcare providers, is is uh, just what's been reflected in the conversation. Uh, the there were there was the initial rush of people being so excited. Uh, and rushing to get it. And then we sort of went into this dip of folks that wanted to, you know, wait and, and uh, see how things played out. And we're seeing we're seeing an uptake now. And I think that the curve, the bell curve, if that's what it is, of the healthcare care uh, providers, at least those that that we've seen in society at large. So I think uh, I think we're getting there. And based on your experience, Meg, what can you tell us about the different populations and their response to getting vaccines? I know you've had some experience researching that. Actually, that was Rajiv's research, um, so which I love to cite uh, when I can, but you've got the man himself right on the panel. So let's, let's turn that question to him. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, uh, McKinsey, I think I was alluding to that, that because of different value-based things of our health plan and our delivery systems, um, we've always had to address, you know, hypertension control in African-Americans, breast cancer screening in certain subpopulations. Uh, so these are historical challenges that we ha were um, evaluated on um, and we wanted to focus on. So we use some of those lessons learned and some of those interventions and have continued them. Um, uh, making highlighting that, that we have talking points, that highlighting to the press, um, trying to show uh, uh, both visually uh, uh, using people of color or, or in, in the marginalized communities, working with the CBOs that work in those marginalized communities. I mean, these aren't new interventions. They're just continuing the same thing uh, while society in large wor worries about uh, works on their own inequities. So these things coming together is improving, but it's the same challenge. We're not going to solve it immediately. Uh, with COVID, but um, so for example, with California saying that, hey, when we can get 4 million people in the lower healthy place, using the healthy places index, which is a California specific index that looks at inequities, um, then we can open up for larger society. So then it works with the larger society working with the people they know and, and sharing their experiences and trust and trying to develop it together. Um, I, I can go into how we've done numbers and this and that and, and doing outreach in specific communities, doing uh, um, like hangers in, in, in working with, with the Latina community, the Latinx community and using them, having testing, developing the trusting for testing, using the same leverage points to then help vaccinate, communicate uh, and have drop in using church and elderly groups. I mean, we had Vietnamese community that that they don't speak any of the languages with this technology um, and they don't have access unless it's through their children and how we have to meet them where they are. And, and they weren't vaccine hesitants. They just don't know how to get there and get it. Um, so. I'm sure, Caleb, in your FQs, you've seen similar uh, populations, be it the Hmong population that, that or other populations with similar issues. Yeah, and I think that's a great point, that there, there are lots of people that want to get a vaccine uh, that just don't know how to do it, that still don't know how to do it. And, that, and that's what we have to figure out, how to hunt those people down and pull them in. And the question will be, how long does it take us to do that, you know? How many more people will get COVID? How many more people will die in the amount of time it takes us to, and it's really one by one, finding these people, letting them know how to get vaccinated, figuring out the translation services needed, transportation services, uh, all of the challenges that people have, they've got to get to one more place now, and maybe two more places, depending on which, which vaccine we have offered. And so how quickly can we do that to the, you know, 30, 40% of the population that, that may need that. Absolutely, and Rajiv, I know you mentioned the importance of trust in all of this. 
what do you think is the solution to getting more people, especially those that you serve, to trust getting vaccines? I think I think just open talking, sharing data, uh, sharing stories and experiences. Um, I'm an ER physician, and I saw a patient, and I tried to talk to them. They were like, no, I trust my PCP, my primary care provider. So then I was just tracking back and I saw a week later they had saw, saw their PCP and they made an appointment to get the vaccine. So, so I think um, using historical trusted partners, um, maybe the next time if they see me, I hope they don't in the ER, they might trust me a little more, I don't know. But using those historical partners, the historical community connections is, is the best. And, maybe the fastest way, but like as Caleb says, there's still be outliers that we'll have to work on, uh, but that this is a beginning um, to develop the trust. And maybe with our future uh, um, vaccine campaigns or preventive healthcare campaigns or whatnot, this, this will help uh, use this as a springboard for better outcomes for, for that also. Yeah, I think too, you know, as we look to try to, to meld these trusted communities that already exist um, with the digital spaces that we've been creating to try to get broader reach for those communities, right? So we as providers or technology people don't necessarily have to control those forums. We can encourage them. Uh, but to take, uh, just to, to riff off of really what Rajiv is saying, to take to take the places where trust already exists and see if we can amplify it with the use of technology and greater education, I think, is is one of the ways that we can kind of uh, vector in to some of the communities that maybe have been a little bit harder for us to reach. Yeah, and it's simplicity, right? Like, think Meg, like, if I message someone I'm a patient, they get back to me sooner rather than ignore me. That develops trust on its own. Or, or if that message is coming from a trusted source rather than some generic number in New York. Um, which is how we started our telehealth. Our phone lines were, we were like, I'm not going to answer this call. You know, that, there's a lot of little subtle technology things, but those can be a beginning of the same trust uh, that you can work on. Yeah. One thing we're working on at my organization is, is that at every patient encounter, we want the care team talking about the vaccine, asking the person, have you gotten vaccinated yet? And if they say no, you know, trying to get them to agree to do it and then send the referral in through our system to, to get them signed up. But the, so the real question is, how do we get every single encounter with somebody, you know, the ER doctors like Rajiv of the world, the primary care providers, the optometrists, the dentists, the behavioral health therapists, how do we get them all talking about this every single patient encounter when at the same time, all of these care teams and medical providers, they still have the same work they were doing before. They're still feeling overwhelmed and burdened by just the, the current patient load. And so to go into a two minute, five minute, 10 minute conversation about vaccines, that's a challenge. So how do we as healthcare providers create that time for our clinicians to be able to talk about vaccines with the people that they're interacting with? I think that's a great point to add as well. And it's clear there's, you know, several different ways to start building that trust and have it grow. Um, so I think that's great, great to hear. The next thing I'd love to talk about are silver, silver linings from this era. Obviously, the past year plus has been filled with so much hardship and grief and loss. Um, but there have been some positives that have come out of it. I'm curious to hear from you all. Will this vaccination experience help strengthen the rapport between FQHCs and patient populations? And if so, do you think there is a silver lining in this experience? No, I think I think most definitely Caleb and I have been alluding to this. I mean, if if I can trust uh, that if I went to my uh, community center and I got vaccinated there, I'm going to trust that they can provide me services. If they can now meet me and and I can call them and do the care I need, uh, then I'm going to trust that they're meeting my my requirements and I'm not uh, uh, I'm not different from anyone else who needs health care. 
uh, or and I get the healthcare in the in the process I need it, be it at the pharmacy, at the healthcare, or maybe even a mass vaccine. But I trust society and and I trust the structures out there that are providing for me. I think um, what we've seen in our web portal and our communication is, is initially. Um, uh, general community members were using, but now even patients that didn't use for years have started using it. In addition, as Caleb said, we are investing ourselves more in it because we were realizing that if we provided value there, they would use it. So we're now adding value for something and they're seeing the value and now starting to use it. Um, this this kind of went back when we first went live with our patient portal maybe a decade ago, we thought um, and this is kind of an egocentric that they want to talk to their PCP. Then we we surveyed them, and it's actually they actually didn't want to message us. They want to schedule appointments. Uh, they want to check their meds and ask for refills. They could care less um, emailing their doctor and getting a reply within 24 hours, which is where we were focused on. So I think we're learning stuff as we're engaging them electronically, what their priorities and values are, and we're expanding those values and meeting our patients where they are. So I think. In the future, we can leverage this better, be it for automatic online scheduling um, so they don't have to be on hold or saving the people uh, the phone and operators for the people who need it and the other people can use more efficient methods for themselves. Yeah, you know, from a technology point of view, I think, you know, this really was a triple play for us, right? So the, for, for us, meaning the citizens of the U.S., right? We had patients that had urgent needs. Uh, we had providers that really had that sort of last bit of impetus to change uh, behavior where maybe they'd been hesitant before to use the technology. And then we had policymakers that stepped up and, and actually changed policy and changed reimbursement structures and changed privacy regulations, um, all in response uh, to an emergency, to, to something that could not be ignored. And I think I don't know that everything will stick, uh, but in terms of a silver lining, I don't think we'll go back to pre-pandemic days in terms of policy and use of technology. We expect that some of this will, will really stay with us for the long run because it's proven effective and, and it's proven to meet the goals and the objectives uh, more often than not. And so if there's a silver lining uh, coming, of course, at, at great human expense, unfortunately, I think it's it's that it propelled us forward uh, to think about public health uh, and healthcare delivery in a different way. So hopefully we'll, we'll learn those lessons well. I think a silver lining for me is that COVID-19 has connected a lot of people to healthcare, uh, you know, both on the testing front and now on the vaccination front. Lots of people who may not normally receive healthcare have gotten connected to organizations like mine, organizations like Rajiv's, uh, and that's valuable. You know, for example, in California, most Medicaid people are funneled through managed care plans, private insurance companies that handle their their care, and then those people are then assigned out to to all of us to organizations like ours. And so we have, you know, most safety net organizations have anywhere from. 20 to 50% of their assigned Medicaid lives who have never been in or haven't been in recently. And so for them to potentially have come in to get a COVID test from us, to get a COVID vaccine, to get signed up for uh, COVID-19 Medicaid, which we have in California, uh, that's valuable. So that the next time they need insurance, maybe they come back and we help them get real insurance. Um, Next time they're sick, they remember who Tiburcio Vasquez Health Center is. You know, we're on Twitter now. We're on Facebook. People are sharing our names because of the vaccination movement. Uh, and, and so that's valuable just for organizations like ours to get our name out in the community in a positive light. When people need health care, they'll remember us and they'll come to us and, and allow us to serve them. And then hopefully we can engage them in in more health services and really get them on track to, to lead healthier lives. And so I think that's, I think that's a positive of this entire pandemic is it's connected us with more people. Absolutely. I think, yeah, it's clear. Not only has a pandemic helped advance the adoption and acceleration of digital health technologies, but also, as you said, Caleb, you know, really connecting patients to the care they need. So appreciate you all sharing those silver linings. Um, I think one big thing we haven't spoken about yet, um, 
and gotten into detail on is supply chain challenges, which has also been um, a pretty big, you know, challenge of this rollout. Rajiv, I know you mentioned earlier you were at first facing um, shortages of vaccines and then an overabundance, so it's been hard to balance. Um, I'm curious, how do you handle extra vaccine doses so that they're not wasted? And what did you do when you didn't have enough vaccines? Yeah, I mean, supply chain is stabilizing now, but there were times where we had too much and too little. Um, we uh, um, were told, oh, you're going to get 10,000 less than what we had promised, or now you're going to get 10,000 more, but you need to use it. <clears throat> Otherwise, next week, when we give you again, you will get 10,000 less. Um, all right, so, uh, and current business and needs were not going away, meaning we still had to staff our clinics, we still had to staff our hospital, we, we, you know, all of that. So how do we get and work towards that? Uh, in addition, there's a cold chain process for, for the Pfizer, uh, even Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, Janssen vaccine. You know, they all have different uh, quality uh, control mechanisms in the cold chain and maintaining that. If you defrost a Pfizer, you have to use it within a set set of hours. So we learned a lot as this process evolved and we're still learning today how do you make appointments three weeks from now if you see someone now and make sure you're staffed three weeks from now adequately to make that appointment you can't just forget about what's happening so there's kind of this preload postload and half load one of the simpler lessons we learned is if your nursing staff or your paramedic staff or whoever's administering can work till five meaning six or seven that you stop um, uh, seeing patients around 4.30. So if you do have an extra slot, you don't wanna waste it. You get that out and you have some time to make sure you get people. Um, or if they bring family members like, like the state is in California is allowed to do now, where if there is uh, someone uh, that's a family member who is in vaccine, they can bring them with them. How do you figure that out? Well, you can't thaw something in, in 10 minutes, right? So having them come earlier, doing some of that, <laughs> there's been a lot of lessons learned. We also learned like electronic inviting or letting people schedule takes time. You can't just add 10 slots tomorrow morning and expect them to be filled. You have to think through the process of, of allocating and filling those. Um, and then you add from us, from a public health perspective, we have other partners in the Bay Area that we're allocating vaccines to. They themselves need the extra time. So the when the state gives us time, uh, you know, items that we have to figure out with them, they're going through the same process. So there's been a lot, but, but um, and, and we're learning daily, um, unfortunately, still. Yeah, and I and I think this supply chain situation has has exacerbated the iniquity of getting vaccines into the vulnerable that we talked about earlier. You know, we've been we've been asked to operate on a basically a just in time inventory system where where we receive our vaccines on Mondays usually, unless they come on Tuesday, <laughs> and then we're expected to use them within the week. Uh, <clears throat> And so we've all coped with that and figured out how to do it. But the, but to do just-in-time inventory on vaccines means you're doing just-in-time inventory on patients, right? Because if we don't know how many vaccines we're getting next week, we can't schedule patients in advance. And so the only way to effectively fill vaccine slots then are to use these efficient electronic online systems where we can blast out to 5,000 people and get our slots filled up really quickly but that leaves behind the vulnerable population that may not be able to, to access vaccines that way. And so it's really hard to do one by one outreach fast enough to fill slots same week. I mean, last night, so we have National Guard helping us at one of our sites. Um, they decided they would give us two extra pods yesterday morning. So we added a, a couple thousand <laughs> slots for today. And around 7 p.m., we had to send invites out. So, so we also have to, and, and when they showed up today, three weeks or four weeks or whenever, we have to then make sure we have, will the pod be there? I'm not sure, but we'll have to staff it and vaccinate the individuals when they come back because the majority of the vaccines that um, are still Pfizer, which needs the, the second dose. There are some Janssen and they're Moderna, but that also needs a second dose. So, so I think these last minute changes in things, they're, getting less and less fortunately because our supply has increased a lot uh but there's still you know beyond vaccine supply there's also uh uh a, um logistics supply and resource supplies that that come into play 
Absolutely. I think that's a great point to add. And, you know, one thing that I think relates to supply chain, some of these issues um, you've been speaking about is really vaccine allocation of what your organizations are actually getting in terms of supply. I'm curious, what has your experience been like with getting vaccines from the federal government? How do you think that process could be improved or are there any, any lessons you've learned from that? Well, that was a that's been a boon at this point at the beginning it was unknown there was this gray area where you put in you um then you have to make a call so it took us two weeks to get that system first week we had no idea what our status was getting huge amounts of vaccine directly from the federal government as an FQ site. We can uh, order thousands of per each FQ site. We're also getting state, which also had gone up and down as they changed how they approached it. Um, so both of those provided initial challenges, but now that they're stabilized, the, uh, and specifically the answer here is the federal, um, the federal allocation to us has dramatically helped us stabilize our logistics and, and planning. Um, and, I, and I believe this week the, the pharmacies, in addition, are starting to get huge amounts of federal allocation. So they themselves uh, will be hopefully partnering uh, in our community. Caleb, I don't know if your experience was different uh, as an FQ also or, or similar. Yeah, this has been an interesting game that we've all played, uh, you know, for the first couple months, uh, really until now, vaccine supply goes from, you know, the federal government to the state government to the county government, and then to organizations like ours. So you can only imagine the, the issues that can arise with that. But now we've got this second flow of vaccines, which comes directly from the federal government to, to federally qualified health centers, um, which sounds great and is great. We've been able to get thousands more vaccines in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but now we're having to figure out, okay, how many do we want to order from the state? And how many do we order from the federal government? Do we duplicate our order? Do we assume that one will provide what we ask for so that we only do, you know, half and half? Uh, and, and so that's been a big inventory challenge. And, and, and I mean, small healthcare organizations, inventory management is not what our strength is. We've never had to deal with this. You know, and so now for all of us to learn, uh, you know, basic inventory management skills, uh, it, it's been part of the process and a good learning experience for all of us. But, uh, you know, it has not been the smoothest vaccine supply chain that one would imagine or hope for. You know, I'll say as I, I'm a student of, of public health, uh, so, you know, I'll get a little nerdy for a second and say that, you know, um, we all know, probably everyone listening to this webinar knows that our health system uh, goes back a, a couple hundred years um, and was largely built around localization. Much of that hasn't changed uh, for the centuries that followed. And I think what we've learned, not just from the vaccine rollout, but from, you know, this sort of early days of the pandemic, is there, there really is a role uh, that the federal government can play to help normalize across communities, across counties and states um, that isn't yet baked into the way we deliver public health and the way we do deliver uh, health services on the ground, so to speak. Um, and so I think we, we can see as we look at what's happened with stepped up involvement at the federal vaccine distribution that there's there's probably a, an important role that federal government can can play without being uh, too parochial about it, without being too heavy handed. But um, I think it's time to acknowledge we've kind of outgrown some of the localization uh, that's part of our history. And uh, I think this is a good example. The vaccine distribution is a good example. And I think, Meg, you mentioned earlier, one of the major things that, that we worked with with testing and that they followed through Fortune for Vaccine is to make it actually agnostic of payers. Everybody would get the vaccine without figuring out who's going to pay for it. That started with testing, but I'm so glad the policymakers and tried to do the same thing. And, and you mentioned it, and I think that can't be discounted. At least we're not having the added issue that we see a lot on the provider space as well. Who's going to pay for this service that I want to give to this patient? Um, for the vaccine, we don't have to worry about that at this time. 
Yeah, it'll be interesting okay. to see what happens to healthcare in general after this. You know, uh, vaccines are free for everyone. Testing has been free for everyone. Uh, in California, at least, you can get on health insurance free for everyone that doesn't have health insurance, you know, relating to COVID-19 healthcare costs. And so I think more and more people will realize, oh, we can just provide health care to everyone. Uh, maybe we should do that for more health care. Maybe we should go down the Medicaid or Medicare for all. I, th I think this will put more uh, pressure on that movement when we look back and say, oh, we've been doing this for certain things. Should we be doing this for more? Did, did opening up vaccine and testing access to everyone for free uh, – did that result in more healthcare getting to more people? Did it result in more people's lives being saved? And if it was true for COVID-19, can it be true for diabetes and hypertension and all of the other health conditions that we're taking care of? Should we just be providing those services to everyone? Wonderful. Caleb, you mean this that ER doesn't mean I'm access for everybody? Is that? <laughs> I, I think years ago, I can't remember when, but maybe 10, 12 years ago, one of the administration individuals said, oh, everybody has access. They could just go to the ER. I'm like, that's not where you get your hypertension, <laughs> diabetes care, <laughs> or not yeah. where you should be getting it. Um. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, this has been such an insightful discussion. I feel like we could keep talking for hours, but I want to make sure we have time to get to uh, any audience questions. Looks like we've already had a good amount rolling in. So let's jump on in. If any audience members still have questions they'd like to ask our panelists, feel, please feel free to submit those now by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard, and we'll try to get through as many questions as we have time for. The first question is from an audience member who writes, most health experts now believe that boosters will be required. Have your organization started planning for that based on these early vaccine experiences? Do you have any thoughts about how to apply lessons learned to preempt future bottlenecks? You're talking about like the second dose booster or you're talking about like the next time, the variant booster? I, that was a joke. Um, so I, I think... <laughs> I mean, I think we had a deep conversation about how how this has helped us make sure the processes these patients wanted to engage us and how we are prepared, be it be it by technology and scalability, we understand that or are understanding it and, and making sure we can then leverage it again for maybe an annual in addition to flu, maybe you need a, a, a whatever variants of COVID are around or whatever process. I think if the science comes out that a booster is needed annually or even semi-annually or biannually, uh, that that's going to be needed or we'll be back in the same position that we've been in for the last year. I think if the science shows us that, we're in for a real challenge as a country because we're not equipped to do this permanently, right? Right. We don't have the resources to do it, both people resources and financial resources. Most of us have been vaccinating for months now without receiving any money for this. We've been scrounging and figuring out how to do it because it's the right thing to do. But, but a lot of us are doing this without getting paid. That's not sustainable into the future. And so, you know, if as Rajiv says, if, you know, if they can create a vaccine that's both the flu vaccine and the COVID nineteen vaccine, that's maybe a combo. That would be great. Not everybody gets flu vaccines though. And, and that's kind of on a one-by-one -one basis, or maybe you go to your pharmacy and get it. Uh, but a lot of people get left behind that, that choose not to get flu vaccines, and flu is not as deadly as, as COVID-19. And so I think it's really going to be interesting to watch as the science comes out about what's needed moving forward. If this, if this virus is here to stay and we're going to need a booster every year or two, and everybody's going to need it, or we're going to have more waves and surges, it's going to be a real, real challenge for the healthcare infrastructure to figure out how to do that and for the country as a whole to figure out how to pay for it. Yeah, yeah and you know, what I would say is that this is the time to really to take these questions up, right? Because some, something else is coming, right? We know that. We don't know when. Is it going to be boosters? Is it going to be some new virus? What is it going to be, right? And so we can't just relax and say, let's just deal with the problem in front of us, and then we'll take a breath and figure out what to do. Uh, really, now is the time to apply the lessons learned. Um, we spoke earlier about the fact that maybe the way we did eligibility wasn't the right way to do it. 
Caleb was talking, maybe it wasn't that most efficient way. Let's think about that now. Should eligibility be different or, or any other myriad of questions? And now we've got real world experience, not just hypothetical experience. And, and now's the time, I think, to apply that to the, the next problem set. Yeah, I think you all raised a very interesting point. So appreciate you weighing in on that question. The next one is, you are on the ground dealing with the realities of COVID every day. Do you agree with some optimistic projections that we will be out of the woods this summer? I'll answer this, and, and my answer is probably not the correct answer. And <laughs> if you get vaccinated, you will not die from this virus, right? So if you get vaccinated, you can be out of the woods of this thing, at least for now. And that really needs to be what everyone understands is that it's almost on an individual basis now. If you want to be out of the woods, go get vaccinated, you know, as eligibility opens up to the general public this month and next month, go get vaccinated and then you can be with your family again. Uh, will our country be out of the woods by the summer? I don't know. I, I think it depends on how many individuals make that choice, but I think we'll always have a lot of these restrictions in place. Um, but whether you as an individual can go back to some level of normalcy will depend on your individual decisions that you make. And, and I hope that people make the right choice there. I mean, I think, Caleb, you highlight um, there's the few, like, as you plan life, you are planning for your future, but you also have to plan and live in the present. And at present, uh, the best way to address both in yourself and your communities to go and get vaccinated. And, and then we can hope for what will happen in the future. But that way, you're planning for the next few months, you're safe, and you've done the right thing, and you've done the right thing for yourself and the people around you that you're touching and being with. Wonderful. It's great to hear your projections there. So appreciate it. Another audience member is asking, much of the U.S. approach to public health dates back over 100 years. What are your thoughts about necessary changes for the 21st century? This one must yeah. be for nerdy me, right? So, I, you know, um, I agree. Um, so I'm, call, I'm uh, talking to you today from Boston of public health, uh, Paul Revere, actually, another nerdy fact, Paul Revere was our first uh, chief of public health. Um, and not enough has changed uh, since that was started around uh, 1800, unfortunately. So, so back then, for instance, we posted um, about staying safe during the cholera epidemic. Um, so one thing that we know we can change today, right, is, is that it shouldn't, and we've talked about this sort of throughout this hour, um, it's not about patients coming to us. It's not about going to the Boston Common and reading the posting anymore. It needs to be about us going to where the patients are, right? And so we've just, we need, I think, a refresh, I'll say, on public health. We need to acknowledge the role of technology, even with privacy that may go with that. Uh, we need to acknowledge that people travel uh, and travel a lot, and uh, it can't all just be localized delivery of care and localized rules, that there has to be normalization of processes, procedures, and guidelines ac across counties and across states. Uh, we just need a, sort of an entire refresh, I would say, uh, for 2020 and beyond. And it's time to do that, and I think, you know, maybe that is the most significant lesson to come from the pandemic. I'm a little biased because I work for a technology company, uh, but I think that technology uh, is a big part of the path forward. Yeah, I mean, I would say- Absolutely, I appreciate it. Using technology mm -hmm. and analytics and understanding uh, public health, we have a lot more access to aggregate data uh, that we can slice and dice, and we need to be continue to uh, um, double down on data-driven decision-making using these processes and looking at interventions, moving us from an academic hypothetical to actually looking at what's happening, using those both uh, to intervene, using those to understand and going back to academia to long-term, but also just using them immediately rather than people sitting back in ivory tower and planning things and then hoping the best happens. Uh, we're in a world where we don't have to do that anymore. We should be using what the information we're getting uh, and use that for our better outcomes. 
Yeah, one of one of the center points of public health is having access to primary care for everyone. And we and our country has a big challenge looming with primary care. There's not enough primary care providers uh, to meet the country's need for primary care services. You, you know, we're in the deficit of something like five, ten, fifteen thousand primary care providers needed to meet the need. Uh, and so, technologically speaking, I think that will force us to start using technology to provide more care where you don't need a primary care provider. I I really think artificial intelligence will replace a lot of primary care over the next 10 years with things that can be protocol based, um, things that, and some organizations, larger healthcare organizations are already doing this where, you know, you call the triage line and they put you through a ringer of questions before you get to talk to a human being. Um, And so I think, I think that will happen more and more and replace the need for human primary care and reserve that for people who really need it. Um, And so hopefully through the pandemic, as we've gotten a little more comfortable technologically, that concept won't be as strange for people to think through and ponder on so that we can get the services needed to meet the public health goals um, without having to rely quite so much on, on human power to do it. Wonderful. Well, Caleb, Rajiv, Meg, I just want to thank you so much for your time and thoughtful remarks today, reflecting on the rollout and where we're going from here. Um, It's been a pleasure speaking with you all. And I'd also like to thank Well Health for sponsoring today's webinar. If our audience members would like to learn more about the content presented today, please feel free to check out the resources section of your webinar console. Otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Caleb. Thanks, McKinney.